Hi. So anyway, my, my apologies. I, I've been meeting on meeting and I didn't quite watch the swing of the minute hand closely enough. <laughs> So uh, Lauren, I think our, our first couple of, of minutes in this meeting, we're, we're looking at review of section one through three. One through three. So do we want to, do you want to pop something, you want to pop it up on the screen? I think we talked as the screen share last time. Would that work for you? Does this include the uh, preamble too, by the way? I don't recall changes to the preamble. Did you have some, Bob? Yeah. Okay. Oh, cool. Uh, I don't know. By the way, this is the first suggested so changes cool. of you any member. You haven't so heard like me uh, say yet. Okay. What's this thing about voter when used in this charge should mean electors of the town and citizens who is liable either alone or jointly and severally to the town for taxes on an assessment of not less than $1,000? So there's a property qualification. You must own real estate to be able to participate in the town meeting. Could that be true? I, I believe I believe this, and Lauren, stop me if this is right. Let's look at the language. I believe the intent is to be inclusive, not exclusive. Right. So that the, the, the idea okay. is that you are a voter if you're a, a registered voter and you're here. But if you're not registered, but you own property here, you can also vote. So, you know, when the when the O'Connor estate is is okay. functioning here, but you're living down in Florida, um, then you, it would expand it. Correct. I don't think so, that's what it says, Joe. You're so, the lawyer. So the the state says that the term voter is like Joe said, all encompassing. It's an elector of the town, which based on the paragraph above is someone who is allowed to register to vote. And it's also someone who is at least 18 years or older and has a tax liability as listed. So the way the for some reason, when they did this in 2006, they took this term voter when used in this charter shall mean electors of the town and instead of or. Right. So that's what I am. OK. Oh, look so, at that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I Bob, uh, I, I agree. Fix it. Bob, I, I agree with you because I, I saw that too. And um, you know, just out of curiosity, I, I went to the, the Connecticut statutes, um, you know, just to look for definitions of, of elector versus versus Wait, voter. Because I, I, I read it the same way you did. And and um, you know, it actually looks like it's uh, more restrictive than being more inclusive, you know, the, the way it's written. Well, I think it is appropriate that the very first recommended change of the Charter Commission is about expanding the uh, the electorate base. So well done. Is there anything else we, while we're here? Is there anything else within the definition? So I mean, I, okay. So so you know, or United States citizen of eighteen years old, or or more, who is liable either alone and generally to the town for taxes on an assessment of not less than a thousand dollars. Can I ask a stupid question? Um, we do have people, we passed senior yeah. tax relief when? Uh, four or five years ago. Lauren, is it possible that we would have property owners who are actually not liable? Or is it possible that by the function of senior tax relief or maybe one of the, the deferment program we would be disenfranchising older voters under this definition because you can waylay your taxes. You're in any one taxable year, you're not liable. Well, the, the $1,000 is, is assessed, not, not liability. As one on an assessment of, not, but you, you are liable. So it's you, it's you, the person are liable, but the way my concern is, is there something about the, deferment because it's not necessarily you it's the property it's it's just a slight chain i don't want to overthink it well, well joe, joe hey. another way to think of it too is what about a 19 year old student who's living with their parents and going to school remotely i don't know if jointly would also apply to that 19 year old person but they could still vote so i think on both sides of the spectrum is there any reason not to uh, just get rid of everything after the word more in the second line. 
Let's you have to leave in the qualifier of who is allowed to vote on town matters that is not just a registered voter. So we have to leave this in. As far as that thousand dollars, I can't go back to a different screen right now because then you'll guys, you know, it'll mess up what is being seen on the camera right now. But I'm 99% certain that that thousand dollar threshold is what is in state statute. Well, I think and, and and we we have a a helpful comment from a board of finance member in the uh, in the audience. Uh, uh, Jude, uh, Jude Friedman points out that the that even though even though it's deferred, the liability is still there. And I'm guessing Jude, you know, when we get to question time, um, you believe that that it is still there and personal, not running with the property. So we'll we'll save that piece. Okay. Do we, do we okay, want to stay longer I, on that paragraph? Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I still, I think what we're trying to do is to say that any citizen of the town of Madison can attend who's, a, who's 18 years or older, voters and everyone else 18 years or, or more, right? So if they have a tax stuff? liability. So you are either a registered voter who is 18 years or older and you've registered the, through the Secretary of State's office to be able to vote, or if you are not registered to vote, you have to be at least 18 and have this tax liability. Okay, well, why do we have the tax liability included? It's state statute. That's, That's what the, so the it state says. It? The state says that you have to allow people to vote on town matters if they meet these two, one of these two criteria. You have in, in, in reality, that's for that's for summer, right? right. For summer so, residents. But there's nothing to, to stop us from not requiring the tax liability, right? So, they have to, they are going to be checked in by the registrars and they have to meet one of these criteria. So, they have it, to. so it, it, if I could, I think, Bob, what you're saying is, wait a minute, what if we just said it's, it's you're a voter or you're over 18? And I yes. think the problem with that is then, in theory, the, 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 the people who are an 18 year old in Clinton come and vote, can vote on the town. We would have put, stripped them of the residency requirement. So then you'd say, all right, so they're, they're a voter or they're, eight, they're 18 years or more and who are a resident. But if they're okay, a, resident, or a resident, right? Yeah, if they're a resident, then we probably want them registered to vote. Um, I don't, I don't, I, 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 it looks to me that I, I think if I could channel my inner Nancy, I think that she'd immediately be concerned about trying to prove who gets to vote if the rules aren't fairly clear. I think anything that involves money, like for instance, say we wanted to vote on a new building, a new school, then someone who has a second home here or someone who rents here, but pays car taxes here, but usually it's homes, um, should have a say because that's gonna impact what their costs are down the road and their taxes. That's what you're really talking about. To have a 18 year old who doesn't pay any taxes um, to be voting on a, a school um, because they're up here visiting for the summer um, would be, I just think that, that was really to protect the people that really pay the bills in this town. If you're going to spend money, if you're going to support the town, you should have a say. And I think that was the hope here, um, especially with important matters that really, um, really changed the tax structure in our town. I don't, don't misunderstand. I don't have a problem with allowing somebody who lives in New York, but has a summer place here to allow them to vote in the town meeting. I'm not trying to ex ex exclude those people. I'm just trying to include Matt's example of the kid, the kid who's, who's 18 or a homeless person. Well, if they're registered to vote, then they'll be able to vote. But what if they're not registered to vote? then they should go get registered to vote. <laughs> if they're over 18 mm -hmm. and they're not a registered voter, okay. they cannot vote in elections at all. 
but if there is a, an item that goes to town meeting and they don't have a tax liability, they are not eligible to vote at an item at town meeting yeah, because they have to have the current situation. Some, right. Yeah, and this is the, the state says they have to meet one of these two. You guys can't, you can't make it all encompassing to anybody over the age of 18 who has no tax oh, liability to the town. So this, this the state says they have to have a tax liability to the to the town. So this the okay earlier my misunderstanding was I thought the state said that it required that you had to allow people with a tax liability to become involved, but that it didn't preclude it being broader. But now you're saying that it precludes broadening the state, state statute. Well, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to argue. I will take a look at it, but not now. Well, and just so you know, I, I think I even referenced the statute on that red line document that I sent to you guys in the beginning of the process. So, uh, is there? So, I, I think in concept, we've still, you know, we can certainly revisit it, but it seems in concept we're holding the, the two provisions of state statute. I, I would argue that should we clear up the wording? I mean, not, not to, you know, first of all, the 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 and the and or that meant we were running for the last you know 15 years on some somewhat you know confused language um mm -hmm. that's a bit of a big thing and then the second thing is should should we clarify exactly what this is you know those who can vote shall be deemed voters and voters are you know a and b so this is lifted exactly from state statute and these are the terms that the state uses because we actually went through this in the 2015 cycle as well you like I don't know but um, in 2015 we agreed that you would automatically assume that the term voter would be a registered voter and we tried to change these terms we tried to make them the voter is a you know, in the second paragraph here, and the term elector would be the all encompassing. Um, and the state said no. Well, this is should, state nomenclature and it has to, it has to remain yeah, so this. Should we make reference to the state statute if we're looking at a defined term? Yeah. I mean, you know, so I, I mean, I get it, but I, I, I think we need to make this a little bit user friendly. <laughs> Keep an eye on. Okay. Well, I think you'd want to do that for elector as well, too, because this doesn't also tell you exactly what elector is. Entitled to exercise the privileges of any elector in town. So maybe a reference to that as well. Because I, I do believe that these two things do cause confusion for the public. The public that actually has looked at the charter. Well, because none of it's in common usage. Right. Okay, so yeah, I th I I think to the extent that if we're if we're relying on quoted terms that are defined, we should from the statute we should call back to it. Though when we call back to it, Lauren, we need to use the the Connecticut General Statute, blah blah, you know, you know, one dash blah 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 blah, you know, bracket and then give the date. So if it's, if it's renumbered, so then we're called back to the right time. I'll, okay. go, I'll put that in after the meeting tonight and yeah, send it thank out you. with the red line. And then Joe, did you, was your intent to look at or include the suggestions too that um, were given on the copy, the staff, you know, under, for example, where it says uh, the suggestion to strike the reference to home rule statute as it's redundant in uh, under B in the preamble? Yeah, so do we want to, Lauren, do we, do we want to put up the strike version of this instead of what we're looking at? What, what do you think would be most efficient? Yeah, I, I think having the, the redlined uh, version can, that, um, that she sent out would be best. Can you see both now? Just one. Just you, one. Can only, you can still just see one? Okay, hold on one second. Yeah. No. How about now? Now do you see both? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Liz. All right, team. Where to next? Do you want... 
do you want to do should we just sort of call them out in order um you know is there anything within is there anything within 1.1 1 .1 that we've got oh i see what you've done i was confused for a second i've got it cool trying to make it easy no no this is this is super slick but i have a bigger than average screen so let me know if you guys can still see it um but but so you know one dot one the 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 town I assume unless anyone sees anything within its language. I notice in their recommendations on this section that they said um, remove reference to specific state statutes as they may change, and you know state statutes are always being adjusted, so that might be a thought too. Uh, I'm surprised, Representative Cookaruda, that you would say that they, there's a lot of changing to state statutes. Oh God. You know, but um, I mean, we we may. So my only my only thought is when we when we provide the reference, we just need to provide the date, so we affix it to what okay. it is. All right, you're right. You know, because I I, I I'm sort of torn to the uh, I'm sort of torn to the where I think Matt was going with this that we we need people to be able to understand you know where to go to it. If it means we have to update it once in a while, we do. But um, you know, I I just think we need people to pick it up. So let's look at 1.2 then. So um, where, where we say strike out in B, it wasn't so much strike out the reference to the state statutes, but just that we didn't need to specifically say home rule law and any other general statutes or any special act because they're all part of the state statutes. So if you just say we're loop, you know, we're referring back to state statutes in general, it accomplishes the same thing. That seems reasonable to me. I would agree. Yeah, you know what? Let's uh, let's ask um, Ira when he comes in a couple of weeks. Just that point, Lauren, just to see if there's something about that interpretation that was needed um, that isn't obvious to us. But I I agree with it. Um, anything else within section one dot two? All right. Article two. Um, so why don't we pause for a second on two yeah. one? Um, the I is there anything? So I've got a lot of problems, but go ahead. <laughs> so I, I so the the language of the legislative body of the town is I think strictly accurate, and I believe is lifted directly from from at least I see language like this quoted all that time. Um, but when you've asked about questions over time, I get that question a ton. Even sitting at the Board of Selectmen, you know, as to who's, you know, what's the legislative body that we're, we're pulling from. Um, and I guess a question, and, and I don't have a solution to it, is that, is there anything clarifying that we should put within that paragraph? Well, I would first off retitle Article Two: the form of government dash legislative branch. Huh? That's nonsense. And also, the town meeting is not the legislative branch. Um, it's not legislating. It's not. It doesn't have uh, called hearings, do all kinds of things a legislature does. Um, so I would retitle Article Two something like "Town Meeting." So I, I I think unfortunately we're we're into the the horrendous world of term of art, because you know the the idea that the town meeting is the legis the ultimate legislative body to adopt or to adopt ordinances is literally what we're sitting with. But the problem with it is they're not doing exactly what you said. They're not legislating in the way that we normally think of it, right? The right. Board of Selectmen are doing it. That's but it. I, I believe that they ultimately become the legislative body. And it's that confusion because I think, it, I think you know, in our meetings, we talked a little about making the charter useful. I think this is confusing under any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, I mean, there are, let me blab a second. I'm, I'm not necessarily proposing something here as an alternative, but there are, there is in the state of Connecticut, one town where the rep, which has a representative town meeting where it really does legislate. And I'm talking about Greenwich, 
where the town meeting is like 222 members. It meets eight times a year. Attendance at the last meeting was 220. Two people missed it. And there are committees. And the committees do things that legislative committees do. They hold hearings. They propose legislation. Uh, they work with the supervisors. Now, I'm not suggesting we do that, but that's a real legislative branch. I don't think we really have branches here. So unless we are forced by the state to call it the legislative branch, which is so misleading, it just isn't the legislative branch. Yeah, it has final approval over um, the annual budget, uh, but it certainly isn't legislating as pointed out. Um, so I think we can do a heck of a lot better. But so, Bob, isn't, isn't like, I think as Joe said, isn't if, if we did reach a quorum, right, at a town meeting and people actually did show up, wouldn't it be the legislative body because they'd be voting on it if it was done as it's designed? Yes and no. Uh, the Board of Supervisors uh, votes on ordinances. I mean, I think, you know, it's just like the, uh, at the federal level, uh, the legislative functions are carried out across different institutions. Uh, the president has a role, proposes the budget, blah, 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 blah. Congress has a role. Um, Madison is the same thing. I mean, the legislative function is carried out in different institutions. So, uh, I mean, I, we, I would talk, of, you know, refer Article 2 to that institution, the town meeting. And, yeah, I don't think we have to say what is the legislative branch because there really isn't one or there are two. So I, I want to just point out that when we hit 5.30, we should bring on the Board of Finance, which is here um, onto, uh, on, onto screen. Um, what I would suggest is, because I, I do think the point is good that it's, again, it's, it's a, I think it is accurate but confusing um, to maybe flag that piece, Lauren, for, um, for Ira when he comes, because we can't be the only town that's had this problem. And let's see if, if he has any suggestions so that it, it, it clears up the use of the term, because because uh, it, it has it has come up. I, I'm personally I'm less concerned about the legislative branch, but literally that language for the legislative body. Um, it, what I'd like to do, yeah, if, if it's okay, okay. yeah, if, if it's if it's all right with everyone, since I, I know Gene and everyone, as I think there, um, I'd like to bring the board of finance um, on on stage, <laughs> and uh, why don't we? Uh, why don't we start our conversation? Because up to this point in time, you know, the 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 topic, and I think that's what Noreen was saying when I first came in, was that the uh, you know people have are are you know interested in the interaction on the budget process between the board of finance and the board of selectmen, um, and uh, but up till now we've largely talked to selectmen. So um, you know, and, and as as somebody who is one of the crossover people, I remember both perspectives. So I, I had a conversation with uh, with Gene and they and went, "Hello, Stacy. Um, hi. Not too long." And uh, I appreciate bring our both. own people. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very nice, Justin and Jude. Thank you for coming. Um, so I I was hoping if I could cue this up and please anyone you know when I'm done uh, to see if there's anything else we put in, um, but but uh, board uh, you know not a big surprise one of the charter issues we have is the somewhat imprecise way that we describe the relative roles of the boards um, this manifests itself in the budget process. Um, Filmer was in, and of course when I sat in uh, in Gene's seats uh, brought up the uh, the what he felt were the uh, the uh, the the sins that I committed when I was in uh, the board of finance role, the stuff they thought was the role of the selectmen, and I think particularly since we're in the hot budget season at the moment, we'd love to get your perspective on how you view your role um, in terms of precision and ways that we could look at the board of selectmen's role and get your sense. Uh, so, Joe, before, Joe, can I just interestingly say please. one thing? Um, most so most of our conversation 
prior to today about this issue has been the role of the Board of Selectmen to the Board of Finance. I, what I've been watching on Facebook really and talking to people is there's a bigger issue of really what is the role when it comes to the budget of the Board of Finance. And it's clear to me, uh, looking at these comments I'm reading, even from elected officials, I don't think people really understand it. And our charter's got to do something about it. So I just want to say this is much broader than what is, where does it end and stop with the Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen. And also, Joe, I think some of the people that just came out from the Board of Finance, everyone doesn't know, it'd be great if they would just introduce yeah. themselves. Thank you. Good. Anyone else from the commission? Then I'll, then Jean, I'll turn it over and you can introduce everyone. Or, or, better, or better yet, why don't you just do it yourselves? So why don't we, we we'll, we'll do it in alphabetical order for, for Jean, Jude, Justin, then Stacy. <laughs> Uh, I'm Jean Fitzgerald. I'm the Board of Finance Chair. Dude, you're up if you're there. Justin, why don't you go ahead? I'm Justin Murphy. I'm a member of the Board of Finance, and I am a Madison native who has been here a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and Stacy? Uh, Stacy Nobitz, Director of Finance. Excellent. So I, we, we'd welcome your wise to seeing the division between your boards in terms of your role, both as it is, um, anytime where you think there's imprecision, or maybe to Noreen's point, as you think it should be. Justin, do you want to go first or? You're muted. The phrase we say more than any other these days. Uh, no, honestly, I didn't know what uh, you know what exactly our purpose was in joining the meeting tonight. Although, thank you for inviting us. But um, you know, I uh, I'm new to the board of finance, and I just kind of I, I could be totally wrong, but I, I guess I'll just tell you how I thought I viewed it as uh, coming into the role, regardless of what the charter says. I just thought. We were, you know, as the charter does say, I think pretty plainly and but completely that we are the budget authority for the town. And, you know, with that, we look at what we think based on what we hear, uh, you know, what the town can afford from year to year. And we try to work uh, alongside the Board of Selectmen and their priorities and one, figure out how to pay for what the town wants. But also, uh, if, if we conclude that uh, certain things or things globally can't be afforded by the town, then we try to have, you know, figure out ways to find those, you know, to help the process find those savings. And that's kind of it in a nutshell. So I think just coming off of that, you know, I have always been of the mind that the Board of Selectmen are the planning component of the town and the Board of Finance are the financial stewards of the town. Um, and that the Board of Ed gives their budget to the Board of Selectmen. Board of Selectmen takes their budget um, with including the Board of Ed budget and presents that to the Board of Finance. And then the Board of Finance looks at, I, and I believe the, what it should be is looking at taxes um, and the ability of the town uh, to, to, to handle whatever tax increase that is appropriate at the time. So I think it's just very clear that we don't handle, in my opinion, we don't handle projects. We don't handle um, personnel issues. Uh, we strictly look at the tax increase or decrease, which I've never experienced. But I'm waiting for that. <laughs> How, when it comes to um, budget fidelity, so there have been there have been times over the years where. Um, it's been the position of a board of finance or two that money is being spent outside of its approved purpose. And then the question comes up as to what's the recourse for that. And, and so part of the concern is, can you freeze individual accounts? But then does that mean you're really controlling people's expenditure? Like, how do you, how, so let me ask my two questions. One is that, because I think that's a, an area that I think is, is, troubling. And then the second thing is, and the example uh, that, that Fillmore had given us was uh, one about purchasing land. 
Um, what do you think, oh, if the town comes to you and says, I choose to purchase land, sell land, make a financial transaction, what do you think the charter should say about the limits of your, what, should, what guidance should the charter give you to make your decision? So those are those are two questions I've got, and then I'll be quiet and let everybody else ask questions. So the financials that we're given monthly show us where the money is going, and I, you know, whether that's, and I guess it's the cart before the horse. If it's already spent, and we're looking at, you know, what's in there, it doesn't give us much leeway to do anything about that. Um, in terms of, you know, we don't have authority over the Board of Ed line items. So once the budget is approved and we give it to them, they have the ability with their governing board to move money around without the Board of Finance um, having anything to do with that, which when I put my Board of Head hat on, I'm okay with, and I think that's fair. Um, I should be so, clear, uh, Gene is the former Board of Ed chair as well. <laughs> uh, so, so in terms of that, I, I think the charter is clear on that and I'm comfortable with that. In terms of the town, you talk about buying land and I, and I know you've said a lot, but I'm gonna just go to buying land. Sure. I, I, the one thing I, I do think the Board of Finance should have more of a role in that um, because I do think it's a financial um, obligation of the town. And, and I think it, it has implications on the budget. It has implications um, long term, and not since the the board of selectmen focuses on projects and the the needs of the town. I, I think it's difficult then to say that the the board of finance would not say at this time we don't have the finances to to buy that property. Um, you know, I think that there needs to be some sort of checks and balances with property buying. Um, so, um, and and anyone that wants to jump in, um, Judah, I know you're Gene, here. Gene, this is Nor this is Noreen. Um, yeah. In section four four one point four on um, purchase of real estate, it says with the board of finance approval, the board of selectmen may church purchase real estate. Um, so it sounds like you're supposed to be involved. So yeah. technically, yes. I'm not quite sure that that's, I, I don't, from when we bought LaSage, and Stace, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure the Board of Finance had the authority to say no. Is that correct? Sure we did. Yeah, I think, I think they did. Okay. Just like that, I don't know if you remember that parcel next to the Senior Center. Yeah. That, yeah. That Board of Finance I, said no. Right. The Board of Finance okay. voted that part down. So yes, both boards so should property be property debt. Okay. And that's for the Board of Ed also? Yeah. yeah any anytime okay. the town's acquired. So so I guess the, the just, question, so I apologize. Yeah. I, so I, I guess the, that the oh, town leasing okay. property that the Board of Finance doesn't have to approve the leasing. Is that right? It's but when they're purchasing, the Board of Finance does. Is that right, Joe? I, my recollection is that it, it's any uh, transaction, right? Because we try to do capital leases. And if I, I recall correctly, those still went through Board of Finance. Stacy would be the, the better source. Am I right on that? Yes, every lease, anything that involves a future budget amount should go through both boards, especially the Board of Finance. Because so so be hold, holding on to that example for a second, and this kind of, I, I think is part of the, the question for the charter group. The language says just what Noreen said, Board of Finance gets a vote. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Board of Selectmen determined that they really want to buy a piece of property because of its spectacular views of Long Island Sound and it's 200 grand and it's pretty clear that we can spend 200 grand. Um, is it all right for the Board of Finance to uh, vote it down because they disagree with the quality of the view? Should there be any charter-based guardrails on the See, decision that's kind I, you of know, you know joe i want to correct yeah. myself this 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 j that i talked about i think i was a disposable plan or was it i i I'm believe looking. it's oh no purchase purchase that's it i believe right. it's both it's purchase yeah it's both you're right so um joe to your question hey, I think oh jude we just do a quick introduction yourself 
Um, yeah, I'm Jude Hessian Friedman. I'm a member of the Board of Finance. And I do think that there should be some guardrails there um, because I, do, I don't, I probably don't agree 100% with what um, was said earlier about the role of the Board of Finance because it's the taxpayers in town who are the ones who ultimately decide what can be afforded or not when a budget goes to referendum. They vote up or down. They either don't agree with what the money is being spent on or how much money is being spent. I think that the Board of Finance um, has a duty to, to look at the fiscal responsibility of a particular budget that is presented to them um, and see if it effectuates the policies that the Board of Selectmen says it does um, and if it's financially reasonable for the town, but I don't think the Board of Finance gets to decide um, what that, what that um, amount should be for the town. I think it has to go to the town for the town to decide. And such as the same kind of a thing with purchasing property, if the Board of Selectmen decides that a piece of property should be purchased to affectionate one of the policies that it is, you know, that it's operating under, that it's trying to um, put into effect. Um, I think that there has to be some guidelines along the Board of Finance so that they, the board doesn't get into a position of saying, well, no, we're not gonna approve that because we don't agree with the policy, so that's not a good use of funds for the town. Then you're basically usurping the role of the board of selectmen. It's the board of selectmen's um, privy to enact its policy, and the board of finance can't use the purse strings um, to to limit the board of selectmen's ability to function. Um, be, because of a difference in vision or policy for the town. So I do think there has to be some kind of guardrails there. Um, and the better clarified, the better about what it is that the Board of Finance um, can look at and what its, um, what its obligations are for, for looking at different projects or budgets that come through. So again, I'll go back to, it's not the Board of Finance job to look at projects, it's the Board of Finance job to look at taxes. Well, we're so talking I think in terms of what you had said in terms of, I'll wait till you're done, Jude. Well, I was just clarifying and what Joe asked was if there's a piece of property that the Board of Selectmen wants to buy for $200,000 and it's got this view of the sound, can the Board of Finance just say no because they don't agree that the view is as nice um, or should there be guardrails? So specifically, that's what I was just, my answer was looking at that sort of a scenario, Jean. Okay. Um, so I do think that when you start to look at the budget, the, the, it is clear that the budget goes through the selectmen, then to the board of finance and then to the public. So the role of the board of finance I believe, and it's clear, is that we have the ability to look at the budget, to look at the taxes, to look at what's being presented to us, to look at you know, budget forecasting, what's going forward, what's, what have we done in the past, what we can afford, tax collection. And I think it is the role, and I think that is clear in the, in the um, charter, it is the role of the finance board to look at all of those components, meaning the revenue, the expenditures, and, and then come up with a budget to pay to what we can afford. And that goes to the public. Now the public can vote it up or down. And if they vote it up or they vote it down, then we deal with it um, on, that, on that basis. But the board, the budget does go through the board of, the fi a board of finance. And I think that's very clear. And it is our responsibility then to look at the, price, the cost to the taxpayers in terms of their taxes not in terms of whether we approve of the project that they're doing. So I think that's very different. Um, and, and I don't think 
I, I think it's deliberate that it stops at the board of finance door because there are so many variables. We need to pull it all together and say, you know, we have the, the tax collection rate is here. The, um, the state revenue is here. Um, and then we look at the expenditures and um, it is within the role of the board of finance to decide what we believe should be presented to the public based on that. So, you know, I, I don't know what other role the board of finance would play if we just took the board of <laughs> selectmen's and I and I and I don't know of anyone that, in my experience, that that says that. Jude, I understand that you believe that. It's not in my experience in all my years that the board of selectmen would just assume that we would take a budget and just move it to the public. Because why stop at the board of finance at all then? And I yeah. think that's where we are the fiscal responsibility. We have a fiduciary responsibility. Um, and that we take, you know, the board of finance takes very seriously, but uh, again, we don't look at projects. We don't make decisions based on whether it's a, um, a good view to use Joe's terms or not. We look at what the impact is short-term and long-term on the taxpayers and in combination with all of the other variables. So if I could, we've got I, a Noreen, I, hold on one second, Jude. I've got Noreen, then Justin. And then Jude, I'll put you in. So if if uh, if we can try and keep a, a cue, just shoot me a note or pop it in the chat, and I'll just add you to the end of the line. And so uh, so, so go ahead, Noreen. Yes. Um, looking at the the charter, really, what what Jude is presenting really isn't in the charter. And I think what has happened is, um, over the last ten years or so, people have kind of changed. Now looked at the charter and kind of gone in another direction. You've got people saying. Well, the Board of Ed presents a budget and we don't have any right to touch it. We have to present it as is. That's not what it says in the budget. First of all, the Board of Selectmen in the budget in section 10, it says the Board of Finance should hold a public hearing, which when the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Education will present their budget recommendations. The Board of Finance is the authority, the budget authority for the town. And we've gotten away from that. I'm reading things on Facebook that people don't understand that. they feel that the two budgets that are presented are sort of final and they should go to the voters. That's not how the charter reads. It really does, by doing that, what we've done is taken the check and balance because nobody is making a, the final recommendation in, anymore that's looking at overall, as Justin said, town-wide and what, what can the town afford? That's the board of, that's the checks and balance of a board of finance. And I think as you look at the charter, I think they were right to do it. We've just gotten lost a little bit. And I think people misunderstand the role. People understand that the Board of Ed budget, nobody can go in and say, hey, we want you to cut teachers. But bottom line, you have a right to ask um, as the fiduciary responsibility of your, your that seat you're sitting in um, to ask if, if this is the, the right number for the town. And um, I think people have gotten away from that, but what's being said that I'm hearing out there and also what you just said is not in the charter. It's very clear that the two Board of Selectmen, Board of Education, give recommendations to the Board of Finance, which is the budget authority of the town. And I think that's where we've kind of gotten lost. And Joe, as far as that land thing that came up, you were chairman of Board of Finance when that land use next to the senior center came up. And actually, it was the audience pushing that it was overpriced. It was a money issue. I mean, I didn't love your vote, but, but I got it. It was over. It was a money issue. With They felt that it was we were all going to we're offering more than it was worth. So um, I just think we've got to take a look at the charter because what's being said here today and by elected officials isn't necessarily what's in our charter. Yeah. So I, I think to the, to the extent that there's tussles on Facebook, we can maybe move those to the side. But I think yeah. the um, I, I think the, uh, the 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 example I gave was should there be discussions on the on the the limit of authority and character. So I've got uh, Justin, then Jude, and other members of the <laughs> Charter Commission. You know. Please feel free to just shoot it out and I'll put you in the right of cue. I was going to see, uh, cede my three minutes to uh, Noreen Kokaru, but, uh, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we are a deliberative body, so I appreciate your <laughs> sense of decorum, Justin. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> no, I, picking um, on me, Justin? Are you uh, picking on me? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and just quick, Joe, you, you mentioned Facebook, which I also abhor, but I, unfortunately, you know, we do want people involved in, in, in town government and, and in this day and age, that is a way that many people do get involved. So we can't, we can't ignore it. But 
As it relates to the Board of Finance, um, you know, some people, even on the Board of Selectmen, have described our job as, as you know, yes, the Selectmen set policy and the Board of Finance figures out how to pay for it. So we really, that implies that we really don't have a say in what the policy is we, or the project. We just, our job is to figure out how to pay for it. And I wouldn't mind that. It would make my job a lot easier. Uh, so I'm, I'm not against that. But uh, they, and they also characterize the job as kind of equivalent to like a CFO. So when I, my idea of a CFO is, yes, of course, they're the financial side. But what I struggle with personally is you can't, in my mind, you can't separate the, the quantitative from the qualitative. And, I, you know, maybe an example helps. If they come in and say, you know, we want, we want to spend $100,000 to have a new bicycle share, you know, in downtown with, with uh, five bikes. And it's, geez, that, might, that sounds kind of expensive. But if they said, you know, just to be uh, just just to be clear, if you know, we want to spend a hundred thousand dollars, and we're going to find a, you know, we're going to fund a cure for cancer, you know, th- obviously that that makes sense. So that's that. I'll just leave it there. My my biggest dilemma with the board of with the board of finance, and and as the role has been described to us, as you know, as we should do it from some of the, as you mentioned, some of the board of selectmen, is really they're asking us to separate the qualitative or to put aside the qualitative from the quantitative. And I, and I don't, I don't think I agree with that, but I, I think that's almost impossible to do in practice. You, you can't, you know, you, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't deliberate effectively if, if you, if you're, if you're just looking at only the numbers and not, you know, not what you're getting for it. Jude, you're up. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify a few things. Um, I agreed with most of what Jean had to say Um, And I I think she actually was agreeing with a lot of what I had to say. Um, I wanted to make sure the thing that I don't agree with and that Noreen said that I don't agree with to the extent that they were trying, that they um, inferred or somehow it could be interpreted that they were ascribing to me a position, a statement of, you know, the board of finance can't touch or shouldn't touch the board of selectmen budget or even the board of education budget. I have never said that. I don't agree with that position. I've never said it. I don't think I've ever said anything that can reasonably be interpreted that way. Um, But because that is indeed, that's, that's our job. We are to look at those budgets, both budgets, and determine what is reasonably financially responsible. We're supposed to do our due diligence in looking at the elements of those budgets, even though we can't um, make any line item changes to the Board of Education. We still have to look at those budgets and see what's going in there and is being presented to us uh, for us to be able to, to do our diligence. What I was And I think in fairness, to, Jude, I, was, I, asked, I asked you to, my, my example was an extra budget question right the purchase of land is outside of the the regular budget as i put it in so and with that and i i agree i mean gene i think said very clearly that you know we we don't look at any policy issues you know we're we're there to to look at the financial aspects and all bring in together all of those different pieces to see how this um how this whether it's a proposed project like purchasing a property or it's the budget, whether it makes sense to do what's being proposed for the amount that it's being proposed and the impact that it will have on the citizens. However, uh, and I don't think that this board or any of the boards that I've been on, um, because the constituency changes on the boards, would do that but to the extent that you can put up guardrails for any future board to make sure that they don't, um, what I would consider to be abuse of their power to be able to vote something down, an expenditure down or a budget down because of policy reasons, um, I think that guardrails would be helpful. I think that yes, you know, you can trust this board. We've been able to trust boards in the past, but if you're looking generally at the language of a charter and what it should be in there, guardrails that prevent against an abuse of power would be a, a good thing. Um, again, I've never said that we can't look at, <laughs> can't change the board of 
Education or Board of Finance budget, I've certainly brought up objections to elements in the Board of um, Selectmen's budget in the past, and I, and I will again. Um, now, to, to Justin's um, analogy about the bicycle rack for $100,000, um, you know, if, you know, that is bringing policy and numbers together. So if you have a board of selectmen that wants to, you know, invest in, you know, other kinds of transportation or what have you for people who want to use bicycles or pedestrian pathways in town, and they're saying this is part of the plan, you know, I would say if that's the policy, that's part of the plan, we're not gonna look at it as whether we would vote to have a bicycle rack, but what we do look at is, is $100,000 a reasonable expense for a bicycle rack that's only gonna, you know, have five or 10 bikes in there? I mean, we look at whether it's reasonable to spend the amount of money that they're looking to spend on, um, on a particular project. You look at the, you know, is that, does that make, financial sense to spend that amount of money for this kind of a thing is that really uh, um, doing what they want it to do at uh in a financially responsible way does the town really should they ask the people to fund it um so it's more along the lines of of looking at it again from the financial impact is this the time that we should be spending the money? Is that something that can be put off to a further year because there are projects that have got more of a priority in town that need to be funded first? You know, those are all parts of the questions. Um, but to just say, we're not gonna fund that because we think it's a ridiculous project. I, uh, I don't think that's within the scope of what the Board of Finance should be looking at. I think that's within the scope of what the Board of Selectmen should be doing. And if the town doesn't do like what the Board of Selectmen is doing, they need a new Board of Selectmen. Thank you. Uh, we have Dave, then Matt. Boy, a, a, a quick question, you know, just as an outsider, uh, not being involved with, you know, um, the interactions with the Board of Selectmen and, and you know, how the, the real process works. Uh, you know, if, if, the, if the Board of Selectmen identifies a project uh, and using Justin's, um, you know, example, what involvement does the Board of Finance have with negotiating? So is it just a, a yay or nay for the project itself? Or if it's determined that, you know, you, you, you know it, it might be too expensive, does the Board of Finance get involved with, you um, you know, uh, uh, looking at ways to, uh, you know, to, to lower the cost of that project or, or any negotiations with vendors or, or things like that? Or, or is that that's something that the Board of Finance currently does not do? So Gene, subject to your correcting me, I believe the answer to that is no, the only contracting authority is the Board of Selectmen. The, Stacey, if you're still there. Um, Except I in the budget process. Though in the, within so the in budget the process, budget, you're not likely to go to a third party. Correct. So in the budget process, we can take a line item and say, on the board of uh, on the board of selectmen side, we can take a line item and say, we're reducing that. You're asked to blah blah blah, um, and that you know because we believe that that's too high, or we believe that needs to be renegotiated. We can remove an item also and say that we're not going to move that forward because during the budget process, we don't believe that that's an appropriate um, uh, burden for the a financial burden for the town. But that is only in the budget process. Outside and, of that, we do not. And that would be different than calling up the, the landowner and suddenly Correct. Gene Fitzgerald serves as the, uh, the broker for the town. Yeah, we um, do that, not do that. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Be very oh. good at it. We maybe yeah. <laughs> this may be an untapped resource. I think you should. Yeah. Uh, I think you should ask us to write in the board of finance. will be involved in all uh, all negotiations. We should put that. Oh, in. No, I was thinking Jean in particular. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll we'll put her in by name. Okay. Go ahead, Matt. So first of all, thank you so much for for joining us tonight, Jude. I want to 
it, kind of have you elaborate a little bit on the guardrail um, portion. You, you were talking about that, but one of our points that we have to do is really clean up the language and define each of the roles um, that are in the articles. So I guess for all Board of Finance members, if, if there are guardrails, what would that language look like? You might, and I'm just really thinking off the top of my head here, um, you might consider some, some negative language um, or some comparative language. Um, the Board of Finance, um, you know, it, it's, it's deliberations or it's um, due diligence do not include you know, and, and look at what it doesn't include or, or comparatively, um, while, the, while the Board of Selectmen does ABC, the Board of Finance does CDE, because there, there is some overlap, you would think, um, in, in making the budgets. I think both the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Education are also charged with presenting a, a reasonable budget, so they're there may be some overlap in what they do to that extent. Um, so it, it may be along either of, of those ways of looking at language for the guide, the guardrails. I, I think what you wanna, in terms of, you know, you wanna be careful not to hamstring a board of finance if you have, and it can happen on either side. You can have a board of finance go off the rails and, and have a tremendous amount of um, freedom in either adding money to the budget, which is within our purview, or removing within the budget process or removing it. So you have to be careful that you don't hamstring them because if you have a board of selectmen that decides in any given year, we're gonna do all of these projects in one year, we're gonna increase the taxes by that much in order to pay for them. I think you have to be careful if you were gonna put guardrails on because it is the checks and balances of the town. And I think although there is some more that overlaps, I think anyone that has been, I think, in public office in this town understands the value of having that balance. And I would be really careful to change too much language and put too many guardrails on one board and not the other. I think what you really want to do is clarify what who's the you know the fiscal what the fiscal responsibility of the board of finance is and what the planning responsibility of the board of selectmen is. But I would be really careful to say that a board of selectmen could not put a project forward <clears throat> as a guardrail, <clears throat> and I would be careful not to say the board of finance cannot. Um, alter a budget request based on the entire, based on their fiduciary responsibility to look at what's all encompassing to a town. So I think that would be my concern with guardrails and, and for either board. I think everybody has to have the opportunities to do what they were elected to do. And, and we have to make sure that we check and balance on each other. And I, and I think that's really important. So Gene, that makes sense. So really clarifying what is policy authority and what is the fiscal um, fiduciary authority, budget authority. Okay. Right, right. And That's what I think needs to be clear. Not so much saying what one, you know, and, and you know, what can't do. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. I think you've got to give both boards the ability to do, stay in their lane. And I think that's how you define those roles but everybody has to have the ability. You know, there's been controversy over in the past, in recent history, um, over if the Board of Finance discusses um, taxes and the mill rate prior to the Board of Selectmen bringing the budget forward. And, and I understand that from a Board of Selective perspective, they are allowed to bring whatever budget they want forward. The goal is, I think, to, have the ability to have those conversations. And if the Board of Finance is staying in their role and just saying in certain, in certain budget cycles, we need to be careful, this is what we are thinking, but not formally dictating, 
the Board of Selectmen has the opportunity then to make their changes or say, no, nope, we're gonna put exactly what we intended to put forward. And that's where I think it's important to allow each board the authority to do what their job is. Thank you. Excellent. And, and it, it is interesting that some of the way that people have been in town government talk about these boards, the Board of Selectmen have this role, the Board of Finance, that language really isn't in the charter. Right. Um, I had a, a question for, for, for Stacy. Um, who I'm sure would rather not answer a question. No, uh, you Stacey, know me too well, Joe. Yeah. So here, here's here's something I mentioned at the beginning that sort of troubles me because I don't know the answer to it, and I and but it has come up over the years. So we we go through a process, we dither back and forth, we pass a budget, and a board of selectmen spends money outside of budget. Sometimes it's for a great reason. There's a town emergency. We've had lots of them. Sometimes it's a disagreement among the boards. What should be the intra-budget cycle role of the Board of Finance in that circumstance? Do, does the board have any vote? So if Gene decides, you know, right now, town is overspending, pick your favorite line item, tree clearing, you know, I, you know, you're, we're taking the tree clearing budget and we're instead spending for, you know, travel entertainment, you know, whatever. Um, can they tell you not to authorize expenditures out of the accounts? Should the Board of Finance, and, you know, I know you deal with other towns, like how, what's the role in seeing that what got voted by the voters is what got executed within, within the cycle? I think that's all based on all the internal controls and all the processes that are within the staff of not only the finance office of every department. So we have so the internal controls here and the processes for approval follows everything to a T. So nothing gets approved without a director approving it. Every single expense comes through my office. I know what the budget is. We do not allow departments to go over budget. And um, everything after my office goes to the first selectman or the superintendent. So all these checks and balances um, and internal controls are already in place. And I think in the boards have to rely on the expertise of the staff to follow that process. My role is to report to the board of finance every month, the expenditures. So if they see a certain expenditure went over then they could question me and then you know, it's my reputation, my job that I didn't follow the right process. So I think they have to rely on the staff to do the right thing. Um, and again, the auditors come out, they look at our internal controls, they look at the process and make sure everything's in place. So I don't really, th there's no way to stop business and wait for a monthly board of finance meeting to approve checks before we pay the utility bills or anything like that. Right. So I just think it's relying on the internal controls and the processes that are in place. I believe Joe that the board of finance can step in and say, this money is gonna be moved after the people have voted on the budget. I don't believe that's within our role. I'm sorry, you're getting a little soft, Jean. Sorry, I don't believe that's within our role. I think the budget is passed. And the, and as Stacy said, there's checks and balances within the town to do that. But unless the auditors picked up some, some huge discrepancy, the Board of Finance would not step in and say, you use this for tree removal and you should have used, um, you know, and I want this to now go over to, to snow removal. That would have to be done through the first selectman's office. A, because that's a better they, example. And, you know, thank so, you. So, it, so it, it's, it's, it's your collective you know, belief that really once you vote the budget, the next check and balance is the voters agreeing that the Board of Selectmen did it correctly. Correct. And the auditors. And the auditors. And, I, and right. in my monthly reports, I would get totally uh, called out on if we bought pencils out of our snow removal account if we bought so then let me ask you that let me ask you the flip side on it's a complex organization of you know 80 some odd million dollars sometimes we should be able to move small amounts of money around we have we used to do a a a, a uh, an account form fit where we look at accounts that are overspent or underspent by x amount of dollars 
for their approval to make sure that the, the budget was not even just right overall, but shaped correctly. Is there anything that's an unusual constraint over things that, frankly, Stacy just normally do? Yeah, so I did go through the charter and I have a bunch of stickies here, but my highlight with the star on it, Joe, is actually addressing that as far as special appropriations and line item transfers. Currently, line Could item- Could you explain to the board what these are? Sure. Special appropriations currently, if a department is about to or wants to go over a budgeted line item, they have to go through the process per the charter of going to the Board of Selectmen, Board of Finance, and town meeting if it's over $50,000. And at that point, if it's approved, it comes out of our undesignated fund balance and goes into that budgeted line item. So in our undesignated fund balance is pretty much retained earnings in a normal world. It's our balance that we've kind of built up over the years. So that's one option. The other option is doing a line item transfer. And currently the way the charter is written within a certain department, a department head could ask to line transfer from snow removal to office supplies or vice versa, or Jean or Joe, one of your examples, do a line item transfer. And currently the way the charter reads is every single line item transfer has to go to the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance. So that's the way the charter is right now. I do have some ideas on how to limit that so that not every $2 line item transfer has to go through the process, maybe do a percentage based based on the department or based on the total um, budget. So those were my ideas as I was going through trying to prepare for tonight. Because, uh, and, and Stacy, unless there's been a change, these come up with great regularity in terms of uh, line item transfers and special appropriations? So there's been a little bit of a change since you were uh, running the show, right, Jean, for special- I'm a big fan of the special appropriations, Joseph. If it's yeah. not in the budget, but we, we do them, but I'm a little bit more careful with them. And yes, they are. <laughs> they scrutinize them very well. Um, now that we have CIP and it's been up and rolling for five or six years, you know, we're planning mm -hmm. a lot better. I know, crazy, right? We're planning a lot better and um, these surprises don't come up as frequently. And um, the line item transfers, they still do every year. But again, we're trusting the department head to work in total within their total budget. And it's really just moving from A to B, you know, no extra funds being requested from the town. Yeah, and that's what I mean. The, the budget's approved, so the line items are approved. And, and so for the most part, that's not an issue. Excellent. Any other thing outside of the types of things we've talked about that you think should be charterized i mean it's or or uncharterized i mean as soon as we put something in the charter we're stuck with it you know and for good and for ill so is there anything else yeah go ahead justin i just had a question i don't know to your point but um uh we were talking about disposition of property and i and i um i i wanted to clarify what what do what does the town or the charter say with regard to leasing property we leased olm prep you know a couple of years ago and I think it did go before the Board of Finance, but I, I don't think that was necessarily required. So I was I was curious myself, um, uh, just as to how, when you talk about disposition, it, it obviously it's easy when you're thinking of a sale and a threshold dollar amount, and even same on the purchase side. But but what what do we think in terms of if you're leasing a property? Go ahead, so if I, if I could quickly, it's either the, and Lauren, you can correct me, it's either the uh, Board of Finance Regulations or the Board of Selectmen Policy or both, but any lease that we're committing to, which was, would be where we were leasing property or something, should go to both boards. Because again, it impacts future budget um, years. But when this came up, this really wasn't addressed anywhere. So we kind of followed that, even though it was in the reverse um, order. Great. Yeah, and we took it to town meeting under section 10.2, which is approval of the changing of the use of the building. So it was a public building and the use was being changed to a lease through a private entity. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I guess was... just for the real, sorry, Jean, just for the real estate background, I might suggest at least clarifying that I don't have a position or a preference, but to me, like when you dispose of property, you can dispose of it in many ways. And certainly a, a sale is an obvious disposition, but really a lease is as well, because you're turning over, you know, rights and use of that property to another party for potentially a long period of time. So this may be something not suggesting anything, but something to think about or possibly clarify. I would agree with that. Yeah. yeah, it's vague. And I think it would be helpful to clarify that leasing piece of it um, because that does have long-term effects and there is a financial risk to the town if we're leasing property um, and, there's, and we have liability issues. I, I think that's a financial impact on future budgets. And I'd like to, the Board of Finance to have a little bit more excuse me to say, and, but going back to what we talked about earlier, the negotiations of that would stay with the Board of Selectmen. That's not within the role of the Board of Finance. They would negotiate it, but if we felt there was a financial risk to the town, that would be something we would have the ability to discuss with the Board of Selectmen. And, and if I could, maybe a better example and one that will probably come up more frequently as we talk about sustainability, but uh, you know, in terms of, let's say, solar panels, a lot of these programs out there where the solar panels can be installed by a company essentially at no charge and then the savings, you know, accrue to you going forward, someone might look at that as, well, there's no, you know, there's no change in budget. It's kind of a wash, so that doesn't need approval. And yet on the flip side, you know, it might make more economic sense uh, to actually fund the money up front to pay for the solar and get even greater, you know, savings going forward. So that's just kind of, I guess, just suggesting we make sure we don't inadvertently create any loopholes that were unintended. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, just a quick question on the concept of guardrails and checks and balances. My understanding is that if like, for example, the Board of Selectmen came to you with a budget that had a $2 million item for tree removal, uh, you would probably look at it and say, this is exorbitant, ridiculous. You know, it's, it's the taxpayer should pay $2 million for it. It's, it's, it's so you would want to deal with that. What happens if instead the uh, Board of Selectmen come through with a budget for tree removal of $2,000? And you think, well, gee, that's kind of not adequately protecting the health and safety of citizens of Madison. Uh, so I assume under the guard, guardrails and responsibility, you would go to them and say, you guys got to, uh, you know, put more money into that. There has, so been, to be there has been that <laughs> with yes. the baseball field, uh, which if anyone was around, it was think, thinking the same thing. Yeah, it so it did it, to your question, it did happen. So again, within the budget process, the Board of Finance does have the right to remove or add money. But they so and and even remove the project if during the budget process we felt that financially that was not a um, a good decision we would have that authority to do it. Um, so, but as Joe will remember, I think you were chair at the time, um, it was some good times when that came up because there was a lot of arguments when money tries to be put in the budget as much as you would see as trying to take money out of the budget. Um, so that's the interesting part of it. Uh, but it's still within the budget process, Board of Finance is the ultimate budget authority and does have the ability to, to either add or subtract. So actually a, a direct budget issue because the baseball field was external to that, but a direct budget mm -hmm. issue was it had to do with a driveway over by the park across from Lenny and Joe's. And there was a question of did the town, the town had reserved X amount of dollars to put in a driveway and the board of selectmen removed it, but they hadn't relieved themselves of the obligation with the state agency saying that they had to do it. They thought they could, but it hadn't been relieved. So the Board of Finance went and said, and the obligation still here, don't you know, drop that funding. So yeah, it, it cuts 
both ways and kind of should. Joe, uh, Joe can I just- Capital planning. Go yeah, ahead, Maureen. Joe, you know, can I just mention, I, Gene, I, I, when you said that, I was thinking of the baseball field at the town campus and the Board of Selectmen had come in with a low number that proponents of the field said to the Board of Finance, you were chairman, that it just wasn't enough. They felt it was their own number. You folks put more money in it. I thought that's what Gene was talking about. Yeah. So, so they, there's that, where a board that of was finance. outside of the budget process, but yeah, there was a- Yeah, it might have been. It might have been, but yeah, I don't remember. It but I remember being in at the budget. Meeting. I think it was because it was CI, wasn't it, Stace? It was within the budget the process. See, all these what problems that have happened something. is when you were chairman. Did you realize that, Joe? That's the, the excellence we that we have that's now. Right. So I think just Joe's example probably is much better. Um, if the town, because of budget constraints or because of projects, decides to remove money from a budget item in order in favor of something else, it would be within the purview of the Board of Finance to say this puts us at risk as a town financially. And, and we would then say, as Joe said, we would say we need to fund this um, you know, continually. Um, generally, though, you would hope with the civility between the two boards, there would be a conversation to say, you know, and, and that's always my goal. We have these rules. Common sense should prevail. It doesn't always. Um, but there should be a conversation that says this is a financial risk and, and we feel that this should be included within the budget. Um, I was going to say another source okay. of that is... Um, for capital planning. It yes. could be within the political interest of a board of selectmen to cut taxes and cut the amount of money being squirreled away for capital. You could imagine that for, for pension expense, you know, or, or a lot of other things. And the board of finance could come in and say, no, 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 you're under reserving for the health of the town. And that's their the board of finance's function. Right. Um, and I think that's the up. checks and balances. I think that goes back to staying away from too many restrictions because it will not allow for that checks and balances. And ideally you would hope there's enough civility between people that all live in the same community to have those discussions. Uh, Jude, then Justin. Yeah, I was gonna make a couple of comments. So I, I agree with what Jean was just saying. You do hope that a lot of that can be handled with just some conversations, um, you know, where, you, where one board can suggest to the other that that they revisit a certain number because it seems low and can can you do something about don't you think you should you know before you bring a hammer down you have those conversations express your concerns and hopefully um that can take take care of the problem um on cip this year one of the things that we did there was a um an issue came up after um, we looked at the, the vehicles in town um, and specifically the highway vehicles, the really big expensive vehicles that um, the town had been doing a very good job of holding those trucks together, but they were in a place now and in a condition now where they really needed to be replaced and replaced uh, several of them as quickly as possible. And um, there were, um, the suggestion was that the um, amount of money that was being considered for, re for starting up the replacement schedules, um, it, that, that the Board of Selectmen should, should consider perhaps even a higher number than the number that they had um, presented in the to the CIP, so it, it can happen that way as well. Um, as the leases that were commented on earlier, I agree with Jean and Justin on that, um, and that was the issue. I, I remember with sales and leases of property um, that there was there was something regarding leases that didn't go before the board, and that is indeed the the case that that Justin brought up. Um, and I believe that even when the town is leasing to another entity, that that needs to be clarified um, because that's a situation that's not really addressed in the, the regs or the charter now. It's only when the, um, when the town is leasing um, and incurring a debt that the Board of Finance looks at it, but as they pointed out, when the town is also leasing out, that affects our finances as well. 
Um, and that should be something that the Board of Finance um, should be able to look at as well. So Justin, and then uh, watching the clock, I'll probably see if we can thank our Board of Finance unless there are any other last questions for the Charter Review Commission. So go ahead, Justin. Well, well, thanks. I was just going to say, agreeing with Robert's example, which is probably better than mine, about the trees and the cost. It, it just comes back. I, I, I would love to find a way, but I, if we are the, the so-called CFO of the town, I, I just, I, I don't know how you can separate the quantitative from the qualitative. And so of course, at the end of the day, if we are making a determination that we need to keep taxes down or lower, you know, lower the increase uh, for whatever. Of course, what's going to come out of that is, is some, you know, some choices, some decision among the various things that are in front of us. So, so it's, you know, it it always becomes uh, there always becomes a qualitative element to the to our ultimate decision, which I I I, I don't think you can avoid. I mean, I'd, I'd love to find a way, but I, I don't. I just think that's uh, that's not a practical reality. So I, I, I do think part of the comments that you guys have made about even the way you describe your board and the fact that that's traditional, <laughs> but not not within the charter, um, I think even working that language in might, might help some future group. And uh, maybe even as we do that, we'll uh, be, you know, consult your board for uh, your further thoughts. Any uh, la last comments for our, our board of finance? So thank you guys very much. I know it's it's not like, a, I, I know it's charter season, so you've got nothing to, I mean, it's budget season, so you've got nothing else to do. So I appreciate you adding extra time to come to see us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank and you. Stacey, before you go, I know you, you've got your own separate thank agenda. Thank you for coming, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank I didn't you know all. if there was anything else you wanted to bring up or if we want us to look through your comments with Lauren or how would you like to to, to do it. And thank you for bringing up, I'm sure, which are the two that are both big red starred on your list. It's totally up to Joe, uh, to you, Joe. I can send an email with my comments with the sections if that's easier, or I can go through them quickly, whatever you want. Um, what I was going to suggest is, you know, maybe uh, Lauren, are, are Stacy's comments within your comments on the charter? Some of them. Maybe. Yeah. So Stace, if you want to send me your document and then I'll just com compile and send it over to the committee. Yeah. And if in going through them, Stacy, if there's any particular that you, that you look at, you'd like to either take a few moments to explain now or come back to us. You are always welcome, Stacy. You know. Thank you. Yeah. No, I'm very nitpicky and I went by section by section. So I oh, will definitely send thank them you. to Lauren. And if you have other questions or want me to expand on any item, I can come back whenever you need want me to. Um, but for now, I'll 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 work through it with Lauren, and then you guys let me know if you want me back. So. Um, one thing, Stacy, your role is not, you know, a, is there's anything about your role which you think should also be within the charter? Yeah, you know, you hold a, a distinct role. You you're guarding the finances of the town, but you're reporting to an elected official. Um, so if there's anything within that that you think would be appropriate for us to consider, I'd be highly interested. Yeah. You know, it's never happened, but you wouldn't want a first selectman to walk in and say, hey, post this, you know, um, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, I, to the extent that if you're aware of other uh, finance directors that have any additional, um, you know, protection audit, you know, exposure or fidelity to their position that should be charterized, I'd be very interested in that. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I can do some research if you'd like, but for now, I think I'm good working within what we have. Town manager. Yeah, a better, a more prestigious title would be great, but I'm pretty exactly. good. The better office space, we'll just put that right in the charter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. You're welcome. Um, I believe then before Liz, I know you need to, to hop off. I think we need, should do the minutes. Um, did anyone have any uh, comments on the minutes or can I make a motion that we approve them? I think some of us have already indicated our. Yeah, that's in the right? chat. Yes. We got to do it this way. Okay. All right. I'll <laughs> yeah. make a motion that we approve the minutes as mailed. As he I'll second. Mailed. All in favor of minute approval? Aye. 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 All opposed? Excellent. Um, that being said, uh, so I believe our, our next stop along the way is Board of Ed will be coming to see us. Um, so I've spoken to uh, Galen, who's the uh, who's the chair, and 
some of his members will come in. So probably some subset very much like this for Board of Ed. Um, I think Board of Ed, in some respects, we look at them only from a financial standpoint because you, there isn't line item authority of the Board of Finance with the Board of Ed, um, but they share a lot of services. So I'm going to be interested in listening to uh, them. And Lawrence, uh, I think we're also working with uh, to bring Ira Bloom, who was here before, has said he's completed his review of the charter and would like to come and sit and talk with us. Um, I think our last item agenda, if there's, if there's anything else um, from anyone, I think then what we'll do is at our next meeting, let's continue. Let's see if this 15 minute, 20 minute thing works. I won't be five minutes late next time. Um, if that gets too chaotic and we need to do that longer, why don't we just take a meeting and spend, you know, the 90 minutes doing it on our own? Um, you know, because as we were talking about it, I thought this sounded like a better idea the last time. Um, but let's see how it goes. But why don't we continue with it one more time and see how it goes through? Does that sound okay? Yeah, it sounds good. Okay. Okay. Uh, if uh, do we have any comment from members of the public? There are no members of the public left. Well, we had Al for a while, and we had a second uh, public <laughs> member as well, but everyone has abandoned it was, us. It was my wife. She had to move on to another meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did she leave the moment you started speaking? I'm just curious. She did. She didn't want me to wear it. Excellent. So <laughs> if, if, is, if that's okay, then I think we can adjourn if, unless there are any other Great. comments. Lauren, anything else we should be worried about? Nope. No, I thought that was very helpful, by the way. I left yeah, with the opinion that, that we should put in language describing the board, you know, as sort of top level language as opposed to detailed language. I mean, yeah. that's kind of yeah. how it seems to me. So Joe, I, I felt that tonight was was great because it contrasted a lot of the language we've been hearing so far about the, you know, with the Board of Finance and the clarifying of roles. Um, you know, I, I was really happy to hear about the guardrails and just to, for us to think more on that, what that should look like. So it was great right. to hear tonight. Okay. You know, I, I think I introduced the, the word guardrail and the, the more we were talking, the more I thought, guidance, you know, dummy guidance. Um, because I think to a certain extent, if we imagine the future board of finance that comes in, a lot of them, you know, Justin's comments made sense to me a lot, you know, that they, they're gonna look and say, all right, now what's my board supposed to do? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, people right. do read the That's thing, right. you know, it, 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 we have a lot of board. It's not, yeah. I'm, I didn't hear you, Bob, I'm sorry. I spoke they over. need clarification. Yeah. Yeah. We all do, I think, on this. You know, I think we know we're we're in a situation where we can make a big change here. This this issue alone needs clarification, and on a lot of fronts. So I think this is great. It was a great conversation. I agree with Matt. Yeah, there was one yeah. thing that, that resonated with me. Uh, Bruce Wilson had said that we need to future proof um, the charter going forward. You know, I think that the last year has showed us that things can go real screwy. So ha having this clarification now can save us a lot in the future. You're right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I, I will tell you that the number of times I heard in any of my roles, and, and Noreen, you probably heard the same thing over the years, is that we would say things like, when you're on the board of select, you're like, all the board of finance has to do is tell us that it, if it's too much, <laughs> you know? And when you're the board of finance, you're looking and say, you know, kind of like what Justin was saying, uh, well, wait a minute, I'm an elected official. I'm not gonna vote for something I don't believe in, you know, and, and how can you separate the two? Um, and I, I do, you know, it made a lot of sense to me that neither of those sentiments are described at all. And I think we had three is. board of finance members here tonight that really, really get it. They understand it. And I think um, they're really going to be able to help us with our clarification. Yeah. I thought all three of them were excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I thought that was good. Okay. In that case, uh, you know, barring objection, I think we'll adjourn. So, okay. Sounds good. Okay, guys. Thanks Let for the minutes work. reflect Lauren. everyone nodded yes. Have a good <laughs> Thank night. You. Thank, Take you. Care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Bye. Bye.